is a pleasure to be here with uh, a number of people that I've seen. Maybe just before before I get to uh, the substantive uh, presentation or discussion, is uh, just to let you know what is uh, Water Sector Trust Fund, who we are. Uh, this is an institution uh, under the Ministry of Water, Sanitation and uh, Irrigation, charged with um, uh, resource mobilization, financing, and also planning and quality management. And we work with various partners, such as water companies, waterworks development agencies, to be able to achieve our mandate. Um, you'll allow me now to go into the discussion and in relevance to the topic which is being uh, discussed today. Um, from my background, I'm an environmentalist or natural resource scientist, but uh, I think um, given that water is also in the same space, then I feel qualified, like my friend Vanessa has said. Um, we are looking at um, enabling environment. Earlier in the discussion, we had uh, Dr. Ayub Macharia, uh, who was um, speaking to us. And mostly, when it comes to government, we try to provide the enabling environment for private sector players within water and uh, the circular economy that is under discussion. So we looked at, um, from where we sit as WSTF, looking at almost four perspectives that we think are very important for this session. To, within the water, water sector, look at the legislative policy and regulatory frameworks. Um, earlier on, we were talking about MCA and the, the rest, but when we come to water, then they are enabling and governing regulations, which are very important for us to know so that within the framework, we know the do's and the don'ts and how they favor um, how they favor the work that we are doing under circularity. So uh, let me start by talking about Water Act uh, 2016 and how it is relevant to this. There are various provisions that it gives both institutional and uh, legal frameworks for circularity uh, or circular economy charging various responsibilities with institutions uh, for regulations, for financing, and all other spheres which are necessary. Um, secondly, in 2021, to enable much of the, um, the legislative framework to work, there's water services regulation that has been made uh, to operationalize the Water Act. And it also makes provisions for um, for circular, circular economy. And I will be using several examples as we go by to explain how uh, in our daily work we contribute and especially towards the end where we have research, innovation and efficiency. So uh, you might see um, the Nawasi. Uh, this is a national water and sanitation investment plan for the whole of water sector, and this includes what all the counties and water sector institutions are uh, planning to invest in the near future horizon. Um, it is important also uh, when we are thinking about circular economy to talk about the, the governance aspects and uh, the simple definition sometimes of governance is service delivery and how those institutions which are charged with um, uh, uh, the various responsibilities are able to deliver. Uh, when it comes to the water and sanitation or the sector, um, we know a number of players which are there. We have water companies, we have water works development agencies, we have WASREB which is a regulator, and how are they um, enhancing the governance because service delivery, be it in circular economy or otherwise, will not happen if we do not have good governance structures. In the water sector, the basic or the institution which is mostly charged with governance 
is WASREB, and you will find how we work closely with WASREB to make sure that most of the institutions that are doing service delivery within the sector are able to work. Um, I earlier on talked about the role of Water Sector Trust Fund in financing. And um, if we talk about financing, some two parameters which are very important is the sustainability of the financing, is the innovativeness of the financing so that it is there in the long term. WSTF is one of the heavily donor funded institution, of course with the aim of funding other institutions again downstream. And um, in order to do this, we must be able to make sure that even though we get limited budget support from the government, we are able to still accomplish the mandate of the institution by making sure that we are able to increase the coverage. And all this comes in circular economy because we know the advantages which comes with circular economy. If we are able to finance innovatively, then downstreams we will be achieving the, uh, the objectives of, of circular economy. And some of them, I know when Amadi introduced me was able to deliver with support from World Bank is called output-based aid, where uh, water companies have been able to secure loan from the banks. But what is more important are the sanitation projects which have been undertaken by such loans uh, in terms of the recycling processes and the efficiencies which are inherent in such systems. Um, we are currently getting into the frontier of uh, public-private uh, partnerships. And uh, if you have been keen on what the president has been talking about, this is where the way to go so that we free up a lot of financial resources that we have for basic services, while for the biggest projects, we are able to fundraise through the innovative means. And lastly, research and innovation. Um, some of the challenges facing the sector is uh, like non-revenue water, which currently stands at 45%, meaning that from the production to the end, we lose 45% of the water. Uh, from a business perspective, this can be turned into several millions of what we lose, or billions, and how that water, if saved, could, for instance, run Nairobi for almost 30 years in the whole country. We have tried our best with various partners, such as GIZ, to develop um, treatment plants, which are basically for water reuse and recycling. We have a technology uh, called decentralized treatment facility, which is more of a localized um, containment for or uh, fecal sludge treatment plant for managing wat wastewater treatment within uh, small localities with low carbon footprints and uh, effective and efficient. And it can be done in smaller units, in smaller areas, because you all know to develop a comprehensive um, or a conventional sewerage treatment plant, you averagely need uh, almost 3 billion Kenya shillings for you to have a very effective one. So with the upcoming and decentralization due to the county uh, government or um, um, uh, that came with uh, the new constitution in 2010, we find this very appropriate for the small upcoming towns to enhance uh, sanitation in those areas. We are also trying to work on uh, a number of initiatives as mentioned, green energy and uh, climate proofing in most of our projects, which are within the spectrum of uh, circular economy. Uh, roads for water initiatives, we are partnering with others because the premise of circular economy is to avoid wastage as much as is possible. Maybe some of the conclusions from the discussion that I've had on the prior slide 
is uh, this belongs squarely on our side, having the government goodwill on climate change. Um, we all know and we have been told COP27 is on the way. How many of us are participating? What, are, what is the country position? Um, that would have been best answered by Dr. Macharia if he was here. And we know all the requirements for reporting or, and what we have been able to do. Focus on sanitation. There is a bias already in terms of investments and in terms of targets. Um, when you go to the Ministry of Water and Sanitation and get the statistics, you will find two things. That the attainment or the coverage of uh, water is between 60 to 70 percent. I know it's a staggering statistics. And that of sanitation is below 30 percent. And that is directly proportional to the levels of investment that uh, are being made. If we critically analyze in terms of circular economy, the same water that is being used in underwater supply is the same one which is not taken care of under sanitation. So there should be a proportionate consideration so that we achieve the development targets under the SDG and most of the economic blueprints for the, this country. Um, I think embracing technology uh, that has been uh, spoken about. I have uh, talked about some of the examples and partnerships that we do have, as well as in terms of infrastructure design, then um, we should focus on um, some of the plans like having uh, water harvesting technologies instead of all the water moving down to the Indian Ocean, then we have a pragmatic solutions. Um, some of the think tanks are now saying, if we did enough water harvesting, perhaps we would not even need to do boreholes. And so boreholes would really be done uh, when it is properly necessary. Thank you. That brings me to a brief of this presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Willis. Great. So ideally, we uh, just kicked off the discussion looking at uh, what um, the government is doing through the, uh, the trust fund uh, in terms of getting access to financing uh, to be able to increase access to water and sanitation, but more specifically also working in the uh, ASAL areas. Um, I know we gave him a very short time. They're also implementing a project that is also looking at the ASAL areas uh, with the EU and other different projects uh, that's aimed at increasing access to water and sanitation. Um, I didn't read through his bio because he has worked for different organizations, uh, including Open Society, uh, Danida, and other uh, great organizations. And before, he was also the chief um, uh, manage, uh, investment officer at the Water uh, uh, Sector Trust Fund. Um, and now he's a CEO. Um, I think it will have taken me about 10 minutes to uh, update you or appraise you on his resume. And that's why I just said he's qualified um, and is up to the task for this session. Um, my next uh, panelist is, um, he doesn't like uh, the title, but I will still sneak it in. Uh, his engineer, Fanuel Nyoboro, uh, who has had massive experience um, um, managing multi-country projects. While at SNB, um, he's managed a project called SSH4A, uh, sustain, uh, Sustainable Sanitation and Hygiene for All, if I remember correctly. Uh, um, he was my former colleague um, uh, at SNB. Uh, he's um, also now a consultant um, on, on matters environment, sanitation, and the sanitation space. And he has also vast experience also on I. WRM, Integrated Water Resource Management. Um, let me not go deeper into his resume. Otherwise, I will also take another 15 minutes uh, to appraise this. So allow me to invite uh, Engineer Fano in your borough. I appreciate him as he comes. Thank you, um, Ebenezer. Good afternoon. All protocols observed. 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in the morning, we were told that we are all very important, so it's good to see a full room. Um, and I think there are many more online who we can't see. Um, Ebenezer has asked me to share some thoughts on um, circularity and how we can make an attempt at increasing access to water and sanitation. And uh, to kick this off, we just have a little bit of a reflection on what, what, what's the current status when it comes to access to sanitation and access to water in the region. Now, looking at the JMP 2020 uh, report, we see that uh, access in Eastern Africa is around about 56%, and in Southern Africa, it's at 74%. This is access to basic and safely managed water. When we look at sanitation, um, it's around about, I think, 24%. And um, around, what, 60? OK, the, the technology has um, it's gone to a different presentation. Yeah. So the, basically, what's happening is that we are way off track when it comes to our access. Basically, we are off track when it comes to access to water access to sanitation, access to hygiene. If you look at Africa in general, and these figures that I was putting up were specifically for Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. And if we're going to catch up, then it means that we need to, you know, increase the rate of access 12-fold for water, about 20-fold for sanitation, and about 42-fold for hygiene and it sounds really it's huge it's a huge thing to actually you know you know change the rate so we're going to miss we're going to miss the SDGs unless something drastic happens and the good thing is that within countries within this region are, are already you know um, thank you they're already putting in you know different kinds of um, it's, it's not moving, so I'll just continue. <laughs> Maybe he'll scroll. It's over. Uh, then I go back. Yeah. So there are very there are progressive uh, reforms that have been happening in the region. There are policies countries are putting in place, and people are thinking, you know, how how do we start addressing um, water and sanitation differently within the region? When it comes to circularity, we there's general consensus that circularity will open up the space for private sector. And if you know, and if we're going to achieve, you know, the SDGs, then private sector needs to come in in a big way. And yeah, and, and this is something that is progressively being appreciated. And in my view, I'm thinking that if if access is going to go up, then there, and we're thinking, you know, um, and this whole discussion around circularity, one of the things that, um, there are about, about six different things that just come to my mind, and I'm thinking the things that we need to address. One is demand management. When you think about water, and you think about urbanization, and, and, and these figures that you see in the JMP report, um, basically, in the back of your mind, think that in the Eastern African region, about 29% is urban. Of that population, 29% is urban. In the Southern African region, 51% urban. So urbanization, rapid urbanization, is creating a lot of pressure on our water resources and how we are using water. You know, if you're back in the village and you want to bathe, you could get by with 15, 20 liters. You, but if you have a shower and it's really, you know, it's flowing nicely, maybe delivering 10 liters per minute, you want to spend quite a bit of time there, easily do 50 liters of water. And demand management means that we really need to kind of reduce this pressure because as urbanization 
you know, is, is going up. It's creating more pressure on these resources than we are faced with a very difficult position. The second thing that comes to my mind is the issue around storage. When you look at the countries in this region, they are classified within the JMP, they are classified as not water stressed. What that means is that the renewable water, which comes from the rainfall and all, the renewable um, water is, uh, I've already skipped this bit, so. Um, so renewable water comes from the rainfall. And so what that means is that when they say we are not water stress, what it means is that the amount of water we are using compared to the amount of rainfall is not that badly off. So we are at about 25% of, yeah, the water you're using is 25% of what you're getting. But when it comes to now what they call water scarce, which it means that they're comparing storage again per capita. Now, how much water is stored per capita that will be able to take you through, you know, uh, some of the times like we're, what we're going through. Then we are classified as water scarce, but water scarce, but not water stress. What that means is that there's a huge development deficit that we have not actually pushed our facilities to a level that we have adequate storage that can take us through um, you know, these this difficult times. And you're seeing with climate change, there's variability in the rainfall. So, you know, we need to really boost storage. Um, circularity. Now, if you think about demand management, taking a shower, can that water used in the shower be used to flush your toilet? You know, um, then can you then recycle that to do something else? You know, maybe water your garden, wash your car. Um, we find many places, people would wash their car with chlorinated water. Safe drinking water you being used to wash your car, to water your lawn. And there's need to think about how we can store, maybe uh, harvest rainwater, like uh, our CEO has said, that there's need to think about how do we harvest water. If we harvest rainwater, how can that then complement the other things that we um, you know, need to be doing? So to get all this um, working, we would need to uh, look at issues around policy around that. So if we're talking about demand management, what are our building codes saying around that in terms of you know the different, maybe different pipes connecting from, yeah, you have a separate line going to your toilet compared to what's going to your kitchen, for example. Um, then we would also need quite a bit of innovation. And I think um, this has been covered quite a bit uh, in the morning and we, we would need to rethink, um, for example, storage. The space to do big dams, and if you take an example of Nairobi, think with Ndakaini Dam, and you look at all the infrastructure that's available for Nairobi that's only able to meet half of its demand. And you think, where is the other half going to come from? And with the variability in rainfall and short and intense periods, a lot of flooding happening in the city because it's all paved up, can that really be channeled down to our groundwater sources, our aquifers, and start recharging them? In the many places where people are drilling boreholes and they're running dry simply because we've interfered with the recharge system. And there's need to really think and get out of the, you know, get out of what we have been used to, to really innovate and see how we address um, the emerging uh, challenges. And then dissemination of what comes up. We do good policies, and they say that um, I don't know. I don't know whether this stretches across the continent, but they say in Kenya, if you want to hide something from a Kenyan, you put it in a book. Uh, policies. We have very good policies. Sometimes we don't disseminate them very well. And I have put in a rider here with BCC, because if you start talking about demand management, there's a need for people to buy in. We need to buy into it and say, okay, 
this actually makes sense, then you know I would put in money maybe to get a different shower head that would deliver less, uh, you know, but still give me a good shower in the process. Or put in money and do some retrofitting in my house to ensure that the wastewater now is being recycled to, to the toilets. So there's a need to get buy-in. And this is just, it cuts across, it's beyond even water. And the things that we're talking about even uh, early in the morning about handlings of, of, of waste. Um, and for us to get there, I think we need to be smart about it. And we really need to ask ourselves hard questions and ensure that what we're doing is smart, it's data-driven planning and decision making. The good thing is that, um, and as we have seen different examples, these are also applicable in water. Private sector is doing something already. So private sector is in the space doing one thing or another when it comes to water and um, sanitation. Frameworks are available on circularity, like uh, what the World Bank has developed and the water in, uh, in uh, circular economy and resilience. And thinking has gone into this thing that we have opportunities just to pick out things and you know, build on them. Um, the circularity examples in, of circularity in Kenya, the, the Nakuru example with Nawaskol uh, making briquettes from uh, sewerage and also what Sanivation is doing in um, Naivasha and what Sanaji is doing with fertilizer uh, from the Fresh Life. From, so there are examples of circularity and I think these are things that we can actually take advantage of. But the big question is, and, and, and this, I, um, it would really be interesting to engage in a discussion and see, is there sufficient business to drive access to water and sanitation. And, and many times from a civil society perspective, we, we are passionate. We're so passionate about seeing access changing that we are seeing business that sometimes the private sector is not seeing. And, and, and that disconnect is something that we would need to bridge. We, we have examples that are not going to scale. Why? what has been missed? What do we need to, to do differently? If it is going to be targeted policy, what, what, what needs to be done to trigger this change? And even in the morning when we're talking about something different, it's applicable to water here because we need to go to scale. And as uh, Seal Africa, um, as uh, it's called Shah, Shah from Seal Africa was saying, Yes, there are good things being done, probably at a small scale. How does this then translate? And, you, and, and those, I, I think because the, the slides had failed earlier, but you can see our access levels are actually very, very low. 12-fold, 20-fold, 42-fold. How are we going to do that? And, and, and I think the the beauty about circularity is that you know it can it changes how we do things if we innovate we can bring down certain capital costs and make things a bit smaller and manageable that private sector could actually jump in but then it needs vision and coordination to make the small efforts turn out into something big so in summary just looking at maybe what, what should we be doing if we want to take this forward. I think we would need to look at technology and rethink how are we doing things because public money would not get us to move 12 fold and 20 fold. But is there a way we could do things in small ways and have a much bigger impact? When you think about demand management and you know the different things we look for domestic what we will do in irrigation industry. How do we then manage that so that if we manage the demand, use technology to bring that down, then we have policies that, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of once we have that space and we have, you're able to recycle. Um, I may not be able to follow Ebenezer to his shower and say, Bana, you, 
you are st- you're, you're staying in there too long eh? but maybe his water bill can follow him there because if he uses beyond a certain amount then you know you start think, you start charging maybe differently because water is a finite resource but i think because we get it, we see it from the rainfall maybe it doesn't come to our minds in such a way that it's finite but in the process of that it's undervalued can we be able to u- use our policies billing and the dissemination and bcc to get people to really just adjust how we are handling uh, our water and lastly i think collaboration and this is something that has been resounding also from the morning uh, panel discussion is um, how are we going to tap into this um from civil society yeah again i think um i i understand that private sector doesn't need to be invited when they see opportunity they'll be there so can we really have a conversation around that to see then what would make that environment conducive for private sector to jump into that space and get us to the next level in terms of access to water and sanitation thank you very much thank you so much for that session um i'd now like to invite uh, alec mushiru uh, who is the technical uh, manager for eastern and western africa uh, for dupont um I don't know if I said it correctly. I remember there was a time there was a movie. Um uh and and people were pronouncing the T <laughs> and 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 they were being told is that a movie or is that a book? Uh but anyway, allow me to invite um, Alex Mushiru. We have looked at the uh financing side uh where Mr. Willis spoke to us about what the fund is doing. Uh, engineer Nyaboro has looked at the sanitation gap, uh, access to sanitation, the gap that is there, and, and also in water. So we want to talk a little bit about uh, technology and what the private sector is doing in terms of um, enhancing circularity uh, in water and wastewater. Um, I think he has had vast experience, of course, uh, looking at reverse osmosis, uh, ensuring that we're able to manage our water wisely and also wastewater. Uh, so. Uh, let me allow him to go through at uh, the session and then we will have a panel after yeah so thank you ebenezer um for the introduction and i would like to before i start my presentation to uh, recognize uh, my colleague boaz boaz you can stand uh boaz is my colleague we work together uh for dupont and uh, as ebenezer said we this office in Nairobi looks after East and West Africa. So we really understand a lot in terms of what happens in Africa. I would also like to recognize one of our partner, if you allow me. We have Elvis. Um, locally, we work with uh, Davis and Shatleaf. We worked with them for over 10 years. And uh, we've implemented a lot of projects uh, together with them. So thank you for joining us, Elvis. Yeah, so DuPont, uh, many of you may have heard about DuPont. Uh, today I'll talk about DuPont Water Solutions as part of business that belongs to DuPont. DuPont is a global company. We are 200 years old, uh, based in America, um, about $20 billion in revenue. Uh, but DuPont Water Solution is about $1.4 billion. Uh, we are in, we serve over 110 countries at the moment, uh, 2,400 2, uh, colleagues. Um, we are very strong in R&D. We have 14 R&D centers, so every time you are coming up with new technology around water and sanitation, um, and as you can see, 3% of our revenue uh, is going back to R&D. And our purpose is to solve global challenges in purification, separation, conservation, reuse, and we do this collaboratively. And that's why I had to 
introduce Davis and Shatleaf because we don't work alone. Uh, we work with local experts, uh, local partners, and uh, we appreciate that as a technology provider, you need to, to work with others to, to be successful. Uh, so we have three pillars. The first one is environmental stewardship. So we work towards uh, saving the environment uh, through technology that we provide. And also, we are also very careful in terms of the material we use uh, in making our technologies. So we make sure that it's not going to harm the environment, it's long lasting, which is one of the tenets of circularity. And also we ensure that uh, the technology we, we, we provide are sustainable. Uh, social impact is something that we believe in, uh, doing good to the societies or communities we work with. So something we believe in very strongly. And then providing water security. Uh, basically water security means as we use water, we need to be uh, careful not to exhaust the commodity for the future generations, as uh, my colleague uh, Panuel uh, was saying. So in terms of technologies, uh, this is a slide that summarizes, summarizes very briefly what we have. But within this portfolio, we have very many products that we can plug into any water or wastewater uh, requirement. So moving from uh, from this side, you can see we, we, we have solutions that can tackle wastewater. Uh, we are also able to convert wastewater by combining different technologies to ultra pure water. Okay, ultra pure water is what you use uh, in production of, uh, let's say, uh, electronics, you know, the, the circuit boards. So we have capability and we've already done this. We have projects where we've converted wastewater into ultra pure water. And I'll show you uh, by examples of case studies. So for us, what we tell you is give us the water you have, tell us the water you want, and we'll give you the solution, that, the water that you are looking for. So we are not limited in terms of capability, in terms of technology. In terms of markets, uh, again, we cover the entire spectrum. We, we provide residential and commercial solutions. We have, for instance, for those who have uh, domestic or small reverse osmosis systems in their home, in their houses, we have solutions for that. Uh, we have solutions that we can provide up to municipal scale. Okay, for instance, if you go to Middle East, uh, we know they do not have access to fresh water. Where do they get their water from? It's from the ocean, isn't it? So we've done quite large projects uh, within municipal scale, both for clean water and for wastewater. Um, and then industrial space, this is where we're playing very well with uh, people like Davis and Shatley. We, we're almost servicing you know, the big industries you can think of in this market. Talk of Kenya, East African breweries, Coca-Cola. You go there, you'll find DuPont technology in use. And uh, within this, as I said, we what we provide is to make sure we make sure that it's sustainable, it's not harmful to the environment, and at the same time, is is good for business. Okay. So I'll quickly take you through uh, some case studies on what we've done. And I had uh, Panuel talk about, you know, what can we do with our wastewater? And he showed a very good example of people, you know, recovering or, you know, making briquettes uh, from wastewater. The question I wanted to ask him, what did they do with the water? Because they only recovered the briquettes. Okay. But I know there's a gap, and we recognize that there's a gap in this market in terms of adoption of uh, technologies to recycle wastewater. So this is an example of a community uh, in Oklahoma that, sorry, maybe I go back. Yeah, so an example of a community in the, sorry, I'll start with this, uh, in the US that had a challenge, similar challenge to what we are facing. They had drought. Um, as you can see, um, 
and they, they had farms that did not have access to water for irrigation. Okay, so what would they have done? Uh, they could have given up and allowed the communities to stop doing farming. But the city of Modesta invested in a wastewater treatment system that was able to treat wastewater to a level where it can be used for, for irrigation. Uh, and that, uh, sorry, uh, and that in itself provided a community with a means from waste. They created access uh, for water, isn't it? So, as you can see, and this is a classical example of what we are going through, many counties have wastewater treatment plants, but they're also going through uh, food shortage. As, as he said, for instance, Nakuru, yes, they are recovering briquette, but why are they not recovering uh, the wastewater and use it for irrigation or other uses? Uh, this is a large system. You can see it's 47.7 million liters a day system. And this is running on DuPont solution. So it's just an example that, uh, yes, solutions are there, and we can easily learn from what we've done in other places and replicate it uh, for local communities. On the industrial scale, again, this is a, another customer who had a problem of what do they do with their wastewater. As you can see here, the solution they had was to, you know, cut away water to a very distant place to, dis, you know, to, dis, to, 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 you know, to discharge it, and that was very expensive. So what Dupont did is that we provided, we provided them with a solution, which enabled them to recover 93 percent of the wastewater, and that water is now going back to the, to the processes, to their processes for, and that reduced uh, the amount of water they have to extract from the environment and saved them $10,000 a day. And as you can see from, the, from that, uh, that is a feedback we got from the client on how they benefited from, from this solution. Okay? We looked at that. One of the problems we have with wastewater recovery is perception. You know, people have problems. When you tell people that I'm going to recover wastewater and then I give it back to you, people people are not comfortable, isn't it? So again, we worked with a, a pure water brew. This is a, a group of brewers that are using wastewater to make beer. They made a skid, and then they would move to the next uh, wastewater treatment facility, treat wastewater and produce beer on spot, and then they would give you to taste. Uh, this one, they were, they were doing it to, to try and, uh, you know, break that perception that wastewater is not good or cannot be used back. You cannot recycle wastewater and use it for drinking. As you know, the requirement for beer uh, production is much more even stringent than drinking water. Okay? And then, as I said, we, we don't just do business. We, we also do good back to the communities we work with. So this is a community, a project, again, we work together with Davis and Shatley, and uh, we provided a uh, community in Kasarani with clean water. Uh, the the, the, the St. Francis Hospital, I'm sure may, maybe many of you have seen this water kiosk near the Kasarani Hospital. Uh, the water they are using had very high levels of fluoride, and through partnership with Davis and Shatley, USID, we provided them with a nanofiltration technology and a UF, and they were able to treat the water, uh, get rid of fluoride, and now the community around there have access to, to safe water for drinking, and, and also the hospital is now able to operate without uh, you know, having to buy water. So that is my short presentation. Uh, I think we'll tackle more when we go to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Um, I'll, I'll ask you not to go back. I'll ask you to sit on the uh, to sit right here uh, as we transition to the uh, panel discussion. Um, now, I just re recalled of the name that I was I was, was coming to mind the other time. Um, you can have a seat. 
uh, when when I was, I was trying to think if I did pronounce the name Dufont correctly. Uh, the other name was a was a movie, it was a series. It was called, uh, some people are calling it Lupin. Uh, <laughs> but it's not Lupin. It's L-U-P-I-N, but that's not the pronunciation. So people are getting it quite off. Um, and, and eventually then people got to realize it's called Lupin. Uh, so <laughs> that's why with, with Lupo, okay. The, okay, nice. So you did correct me. It's, it's uh, sorry, Dupo. Okay, nice. And that's why I, I, I think it kept ringing in my mind. The T is a bit silent, but do I say Dupont or Dupont? Uh, nice. Thank you for the correction. Um, now, I also want to welcome Engineer Fanuel Nyaboro and Mr. Willis Mbaya to transition to uh, the next session. Um, feel free to uh, raise your hand, and uh, a mic will be. We'll have a roaming mic just for you to ask some questions uh, to our great panelists here. So we're moving on to uh, like a discussion, um, more on looking at from what they presented. Mr. Willis looked at the aspect of financing um, and what the government is doing in terms of increasing access to uh, sanitation. Um, Alex looked at the innovation that they have in terms of dealing with wastewater. And Fanwell was looking at um, uh, behavior change and also looking at the discrepancy between what we aim to achieve as a country in terms of access to water and sanitation and the current situation. Um, though the technology failed, he was trying to give us some numbers of the East African region, uh, South African region in terms of uh, what do we see in terms of the trends in the region. Uh, so let me, uh, there's a mic close to you, uh, just be, uh, um, you can, yeah, nice. Um, so let me uh, start with uh, Alex. Um, still, his presentation is quite fresh in our minds. Um, is is uh, treating wastewater uh, a drop in the ocean, um, or um, in terms of increasing access to water, uh, what, or how? What do you make of it? Yes. So thank you, Ebenezer. Um, that's a very good question. Um, what I would say is where we are as Kenya, we, we just at the point of drop in the ocean because we've not done anything. But if we look at the opportunities and the potential, then actually this is a future, um, I would say, if we are going to have access to, you know, allow, you know, facilitate everyone to have access to clean water. Um, and I say this because of uh, several reasons. Um, Everything that we do today, we generate wastewater. Um, the lunch that we, we took here, we generated some wastewater. Um, then if you go home, you're going to be flushing your toilet. Again, you're going to prepare your supper, you're going to generate wastewater. And then maybe you're going to pass through supermarket. You're going to, to buy a, a loaf of bread, a packet of milk. The production of these items generated wastewater. So the question is, where does this water go to? And uh, as, our, as, 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 uh, as they said, we have very little um, connection to, 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 to sewer system. So most of this water is actually discharged into the rivers and treated. Uh, and what it does, two things. It makes the river polluted and therefore reduces access to clean water to the, uh, to the community downstream. Okay. Uh, we know also, uh, and I've been to several facilities that are treating wastewater, they, they do not have the capacity or they are not doing the right job. And there's a reason for this. Number one, it's, it's very expensive to treat wastewater. Mm. Also, they're already outstripped in terms of capacity. Let me, let, me, let me hold it at that point when you talked about uh, the element of it being expensive. Uh, to treat wastewater, basically probably because the technology that you need to invest in and allow me to bring in uh, Mr. Willis uh, on matters money. Um, he, he spoke about it being expensive. So what do we need to do? Um, are there incentives uh, or what mechanisms are available for us to ensure that we are able to get access to the technology? And when we talk about access, when you talk about access to water, there are three basic things that we're looking at, uh, which one is the distance that you cover to get the water. Uh, the second thing is the, is the price, affordability. 
Um, so in, in, in terms of the, 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 what it spoke about price, I mean, uh, and, and looking at the financing mechanism, where are we in Kenya and what should we do different? Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Ebenezer, for the question and uh, for what has been presented. I think taking the fi financing perspective, first of all, uh, uh, I did I did indicate that um, what we are doing at uh, Water Sector Trust Fund is to work with various institutions which have the responsibility for management of waste because we know the institutional architecture within the Kenyan public system, who should be responsible for what. So we have had cases, um, uh, many cases working with the, uh, improved technologies from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the German Development Bank, KFW, to be able to use the most recent technologies and also continue to adopt many technologies which are offering solutions um, with the utmost efficiency. Um, what we have now, not taking note and cognizance that um, it is very expensive, as has been said by my co-panelist, is to see what uh, subsidies, what market-based approaches can we have in terms of handling waste management. Um, we have had occasions uh, where we work with a number of water companies to be able to access money or financing from uh, commercial banks. And we have modalities for mostly subsidizing this, or in a way you would say we are offering grants, but uh, these are dictated by the market forces. While we are not doing actual um, blending financing, but the grant that we give them, uh, in essence, finally reduces the cost of investments in uh, managing sanitation. Uh, I, I know I didn't find time to talk about uh, what we are doing, but in a year, WSTF spends between three to four billion financing the sector, so most of which goes to water companies some of it goes to waterworks development agencies and even lately we are working with um, international non-governmental organizations both on water supply and uh, sanitation management so i think to the extent of what we are doing uh, that would suffice we work progressively in partnership with several institutions uh, currently we are in partnership with uh, Strathmore University to find solutions to some of the challenges. We work with the private developers to find some of the challenges. And more importantly, if you go to the Water Act, um, the biggest differentiation between Water Act 2002 that established most of the institutions in the water sector and Water Act 2016 with respect to WSTF or Water Sector Trust Fund is that there is um, an expanded mandate in terms of supporting research. And we are looking very much into the innovations which will be um, sorting out some of the problems. Um, it is him, uh, uh, engineer, who noted uh, the synergy. Uh, we have works in progress in terms of how to drive the partnerships for synergies and innovation all of those institutions that we can be able to work with. So I think let me end it there. I have given some of the perspectives. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Willis. And uh, you basically just mentioned that you spend uh, about uh, 3 billion a year, uh, three to four, right? Um, uh, in, in terms of increasing access to financing and in, and in the end, what you're trying to do there is to increase access to water and sanitation. Um, and and uh, something else came to mind because I was also sitting in the Nawase that's water uh, and national water sanitation uh, and investment plan task force uh, that was basically looking at destructuring and the debt, the debt that is there with the water companies so it's also a different question on how we manage these funds 
uh, when now it comes from you to the other stakeholders. Um, so, uh, and of course, um, sometimes also there's an element of, um, uh, of, of, there's a difference between efficiency and being effective, right? Efficiency basically means you do the same thing with the uh, least, little resources. So I think that's also another aspect that we need to uh, also also adapt. But we, we, we appreciate, I mean, looking at the resources that you spend in a year uh, trying to pump this to the water sector. Now let me bring in uh, Farnwell. Uh, I, I know with the other programs that you have implemented, you, you are looking at uh, elements of uh, open defecation and trying to change the behavior of the communities uh, so that they're able to be open uh, defecation free, right? Um, now, look at there's a difference between the access to sanitation and access to water. Uh, the last time I checked WASREP report, I think sanitation, looking at the water companies, was about 16%. And water sanitation was about 16, and water was about uh, there about 60. Uh, why do we have this huge difference uh, between access to water and sanitation? Um, thank you, Ebenezer. I um, it's all about I think uh, priority because water. Um, if you look at the reforms that started way back in 99, I'm speaking about Kenya, water had not been seen as a commercial good. It was seen like water is life. So people need to get it. You know, you can't make it too expensive. So for a long time, we never had, you know, that sort of, re you know, returning the resources so that you can continue to develop more as the population grows. So what happened is that um, because we were so far behind, the priority went into water. And looking at that disparity, you would see that, uh, I mean, the other, a few years ago, the, the CEO of WASREP was saying that they needed like, what, 500 billion shillings just to catch up on the sewerage network, just to catch up. And you look at a city like Nairobi only meeting half the demand. So where would you put, you know, it, it's a struggle to really decide where will you put um, 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 the money. So trying to catch up on, the, on, on water is what is affecting sanitation in a way. But I think uh, just looking at this whole discussion around circularity, if you're able to, to make... I think um, make it a little smaller and manageable because some of the capital costs are just so huge. It's so huge, you know, to, to catch up. But if we have this, uh, even as a CEO had mentioned about the de decentralized uh, facilities that you could actually bring down those capital costs, then you probably make it more manageable. But where you have these centralized systems that take so much money to put that sewer network and people are trying to see you know, what sort of return will that give? I mean, it, it's, it's huge. So, and I, and I, and I think uh, Alex raised something when he was giving that example of, um, was it in which, which state is it? Uh, I forget the name of the state, but I saw in your slide $130 million, you know? That just stuck in my mind like thinking you know um and people are recovering so i think that commercial mindset if if we get that right and we can see that value and you can return that value then we may start seeing a change in terms of um you know access to water and sanitation yeah. uh thank you so much uh, uh Farnold. i mean uh <laughs> so so basically you're saying that uh um, we are trying to catch up with access to water, and that's how we're not getting the access to sanitation. But at the same time, we cannot have sanitation without water. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting discussion. So let me open it up to uh, the participants we have in the room. Um, uh, if you have a few questions before we, um, uh, we're trying to accelerate this session because <laughs> ideally uh, we uh, were supposed to have come to an end. Uh, but let us allow the um, participants in the room to also uh, shoot some questions so it's more uh, of a discussion. Uh, can we have a roaming mic? Yeah. 
you can just introduce yourself, your name, organization, and then shoot the question. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Lisa, and I'm the co-founder and director of Nazava Water Filters. We manufacture these water filters to empower households to purify their own water and make it safe to drink. We're the only WHO certified product on the Kenyan market at the moment. Um, I really enjoyed enjoy listening to your presentations. One of our struggles to scale in Kenya is the taxes. We pay nearly $7 per product to the government. And we are targeting lower income households. And for them, 700 shilling is really, they feel that in their pocket. Um, I was wondering if you could highlight maybe uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Willis from the um, uh, what is water, water, water sector trust fund. Uh, what kind of movements are there to to convince uh, the KRA to make uh, investments in wash and uh, affordable wash that also especially imp try to impact low income households? What movements are there to make these kind of products more affordable and then not all the money goes to the KRA? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. We'll take uh, two more questions. So that we we have a question there. So good afternoon. My name is Boaz from DuPont. I work with Alex, as you said. So my question, I think maybe one of the key things that I normally see in the, we do a lot of expansion and I probably this to Willis. Uh, you facilitate, you give grants to be able to do decentralized systems. I'm just wondering why would we have discussion, especially when we, like right now we are talking about, we want to build 200,000 houses and uh, no one talks about the infrastructure. Why can't we have a disc? Because like we're waiting for calamity, then we start asking for money later. So I think for why can't we, as we are projecting to build 300,000 houses in a year, the same way you, as from the government perspective and your team, you'll be able to have this discussion is that what would be the infrastructure in terms of water and sewerage? So that by the time you're doing the houses, the infrastructure is there because that's the challenge I think keeps seeing. And then now we go to a mode whereby now we are investing in a very, you no, know, we are digging where we shouldn't even be digging, we should have done it in the first place. Then it becomes very expensive. That's my question. Uh, thank you so much, boys. We can have a third question. It's interesting. DuPont is asking a question, and I want to ask them a question. <laughs> if you're an individual, you have a house, you want to manage your water better. Do you have solutions for that? If I want to maybe construct a, a house, a apartments, do you have a solution that would be affordable to an individual? Well, my name is Catherine Masoli. I'm from the Circular Innovation Hub. Okay, what, what are the solutions? I'd like to know what the solutions are. Would they be cost effective for individuals? Um, I'd like more information on that. Great, I think uh, let's take the last one. I saw a hand here. Um. <laughs> Now we have more hands, okay. Can I get the two and then uh, we answer those? Uh, um. Hello, my name is Christine. And uh, my question is to Engineer Naboro. Now, uh, what is your take on having dry dry toilets in, in Kenya and Africa in general as a way of having a sustainable uh, water management? Because I think the context, we've been having dry toilets for a long time. And it could be a good way of, maybe it's a solution. And what developments do you think can, can make them more modernized and, and cool <laughs> so that people can embrace them? Yeah, well, we have a last question there. Yeah, afternoon everyone. Elvis from Davis and Shatliff. So i just like to pick your brains in light of the water purchase agreements of privatization that the president has been talking about. And this is uh, against the backdrop of conversations around the struggles that the power sector or the energy sector has been having in, in power purchase agreements. And I think when the president mentioned that, he did mention that the PPP unit should try and model um, the water purchase agreements uh, with the, the power purchase agreement. So i just like your take on what, what you think that that means in the sector. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks uh, for for the questions. I think um, do you want to start with a question from uh, Dupont. 
Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't get your name. Catherine, yes, we, as I said from my presentation is that uh, we have solutions from as small as one household uh, to, you know, tens of apartments. Uh, so we, we they, so basically we just need to understand the, the problem you're having with your water. Uh, what are the contaminants you're looking to, to remove from the water? Uh, what is the volumes that you want to treat? And then we are able to bridge that gap uh, together with our partners like uh, Davis and Shati, then we are able to put together a solution for you. Yeah. So we can we can engage and this this goes to everyone. I know apartments, you know, are coming up all over and uh, everyone is looking for a water treatment solution. Uh yes, we have solutions around that. Yeah. Uh so let's take it from uh, Willis. Uh, I think there's a question on planning um and, and in, in terms of looking at infrastructure. Uh looking at demand uh, projection. Th thanks. Uh, thanks for these good questions. One, the first one was on taxes and why we cannot have maybe policies. Um, I will approach it perhaps in two ways. One is that um, WASREB, Water and Water Services Regulatory Board, has been charged with the responsibility for managing even the pricing of, uh, of water. And uh, for the low income areas, what is most prominent and common are the water kiosks. And um, it has been almost estimated that most of the populations around those areas will get water from the water kiosk. When we talk about low income areas, particularly we mean um, the slums, so that is what it will be in my understanding. So the price is fixed at um, two shillings, by the way, for the 20 liter jerry can. And um, any price beyond that is not allowed. And uh, secondly, that um, this water meets still WS, uh, WHO standards. Um, I believe that there should be incentive, incentives and policy reviews to manage, to manage the issue of uh, how can the taxes, and um, that might not fall within the purview of the water sector taxes. Um, we, I can only take a whole government approach, but we know the National Treasury is the one in charge of um, the fiscal policy of the country, while we might say that there, need, there is need for policy review. The same way when it comes to planning, if you go to other countries, um, if an estate or a, an investment is being done elsewhere, they must make sure water is available, electricity is available in those areas before even the building starts. I think um, it is something that we might review as a country to see what kind of options are going to be there even for wastewater management. Um, the last question. Um, in terms of so uh, I will be quick um, modeling of water the same way we have independent power producers uh, already if you are in the water sector you know that the counties have lodged a case in in the courts against this. So, but the president said we have to make the law work for us. Let me end it there. Great. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for, for those answers. I think we'll end it there. Uh, there was a last question by Fanon, but we'll be able to answer it as we proceed because we have another session uh, waiting. So let's appreciate our panel for the time they took uh, to, to answer through our questions and also through the presentations. Uh, so we'll move to the next uh, session um, and um, if you want to change sessions you can look at uh, the table you can go to the other room or stay uh, within uh, this room uh, thank you so much <laughs>